five of my webinar series. For those of you who have not tuned into previous uh, webinars, uh, this series is all about uh, talking about different types of investment opportunities. But as always, regardless of what that opportunity is, it has to be done in the context of what your plan is. Uh, one of the things I've been teaching for years is a gap analysis, understanding where you are, where you're going, and what your plan is to get there. And uh, every few weeks, we're uh, interviewing uh, a few select issuers that work with us over at TriView Capital uh, who have opportunities that uh, may be appealing to you as an investor and gives, gives me an opportunity to have a little bit of a Q&A and get to know uh, some of these individuals a little bit better and what they have to offer. And uh, in the process of uh, doing the webinar series, uh, you get to hear about uh, different opportunities that you may or may not have thought about in the past. Uh, one of the most popular questions I get, uh, as, as most of you know, I'm a, a, my core business is uh, mortgages in the Canadian real estate market, and often I get asked about what about buying in the States. And whenever I think about buying in the U.S., the first thing that comes to mind is, well, you know, you kind of want to work with somebody who uh, knows what they're doing and has a track record down there. Uh, that's one of the reasons why TriView Capital chose Rock Spring Capital. Now, on the line with me tonight is Jim uh, Jim Hayes from the Managing Director of Rock Spring Capital. So, Jim, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Certainly a uh, pleasure to join you. I've heard a lot about you and your radio show, and so I'm... Um, uh, Real happy to be here. Oh, wow. Well, great to have you on board. You know, uh, first of all, I want to like make sure everybody realizes you're calling from Houston. Is it Houston? It is. It's about 100 degrees out there, so it's certainly... <laughs> <laughs> and that's Fahrenheit. Yeah, that's, that's Fahrenheit. <laughs> <laughs> for our Canadian list. Hey, hey listen, I, I, I really appreciate you taking the time tonight. And a couple of quick things here. Um, when we talk about buying pro, uh, real estate in the United States, I mean, a lot of the people who are listening to this have um, are Canadian real estate investors or have either portfolios in stocks and bonds and mutual funds in Canada plus real estate portfolio and may or may not be interested in diversifying that either within um, you know different types of real estate assets uh, in Canada. But I, again, uh, the topic of buying property in the United States is a huge one. Um, probably less so now that the Canadian dollars kind of come down a little bit. I mean, when uh, you guys had your subprime crisis, boy, that was a hot topic. People were flooding over the border. Um, so first of all, let's look at this from a macro level, uh, Jim, um, and tell me, uh, well, first of all, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, you're working at, as the uh, um, managing director with Rock Spring. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself, your background, your history, and how you arrived at Rock Spring, and then tell us a little bit about Rock Spring, and then, of course, now, why uh, why Texas? Sure, sure, mo most certainly. And so, uh, you know, Rock Spring is a Texas real estate company. It's been doing what it's been doing, as you can see from this uh, home screen, for 40 years. So when, when you talk about, you know, aligning yourself with a local market expert, uh, we, we certainly fall into that category. And, uh, you know, when you're a real estate investor, uh, you know, having been through lots of cycles, which real estate is, and it's a cyclical business and still standing is certainly a testament to uh, us or others uh, that have uh, accomplished that. And so, uh, you know, just to start off, uh, full disclaimer, I have a couple pages here that... Yeah, that's right. I, can't, I always forget to do the disclaimer and that, that's critical. Certainly, you know, cruise through, but, you know, I'm not here to uh, sell anything at all. Uh, instead, what I really want to talk about is uh, a really interesting place, which is Texas, for a number of reasons, and in a really interesting and compelling real estate strategy land. And, and that's what we do in particular is Texas land. And, and our product uh, can be sold uh, through Canada with an exempt market dealers, including TriView, and uh, you know, registered advisors like yourself. And so uh, you know, we certainly can't sell the product direct, so they need to come through folks like you that uh, you know, have an expertise in helping them build a portfolio. And, and you know, when Canadians uh, you know, look, uh, at the U.S. Uh, as part of their portfolio, a lot of people don't recognize that Canadians are the number one foreign investor in U.S. real estate. Wow! And, you know, everyone you know, in the '90s talked about Japan. Yeah. And in the last 10, 10 years or so, everyone thinks it's China because you know they they buy in the big cities, they buy the big profile assets, the trophy mm -hmm. assets, the office buildings, you know, the billion-dollar transactions. But day in and day out. 
uh, you know, Canadians are the number one investor in U.S. real estate. And, and there's lots of reasons for that. I think geography for sure, the warmer climate, uh, you know, lots of folks own second homes down in our marketplace. Um, and, and, and that's a big part of it as well. But, you know, uh, you know, sometimes when you look across your, your, you know, your markets uh, in your country, uh, when you look at affordability, your markets are, are pretty healthily priced uh, relative to median income to sort of medium home price. Uh, we, we look at study after study, uh, Vancouver in particular where you are, uh, you know, sometimes is 11 or 12 times uh, the average home, 11 or 12 times uh, average median income, uh, which is pretty, uh, pretty high. It, it, it has yeah, started. yeah. well, it's a little high here, that's <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And, you know, there are natural reasons for that for sure. Uh, but when you look at the Texas markets, uh, oftentimes it's only three times or 3.2 times earnings, the average home. So the average home down here in Houston in particular is about 210 grand, uh, which is pretty unbelievable. You could buy a 2,500 square foot home and um, things are more affordable here for sure. Wow. Uh, and, and so what we have done is we have recognized, uh, lots of people ask, what is a really successful Texas real estate company do up, doing up in Canada? And my answer is, why not? You know, you're, you're certainly the most active real estate investor. Um, and so we came up a couple of years ago. We put together, uh, you know, some vehicles that are very tax efficient and very aligned interest. And we've oversubscribed two funds. And, you know, now we're on our yeah. third, third $50 million fund. And so that's really the reason. Canadians are very active in our space. And, uh, you know, we make it easy for them to invest. Okay, so a couple of quick things. I want to take care of a housekeeping item here uh, because I want to come back. Uh, I know we have a legal responsibility to uh, uh, go through the disclaimer to a certain extent. Also, want to let everybody know that at number one, we're recording this. Number two, you've got a box there on your screen. If you have, um, if you have any questions, just type in your questions as we go along, and I'll be. Uh, sure to interrupt, Jim, uh, uh, here and there to uh, make sure we get your questions answered. But uh, just in terms of disclaimer, again, everything we're talking about tonight is for informational purposes only, and every any reference to past performance is not an indication of future performance. And any indicate any determination of suitability should be done with the guidance of a registered um, dealer representative of Tribu Capital, such as myself. Uh, and any decision to invest should only be made on the basis of overview of the offering memorandum. Okay, I think we've covered the disclaimer component there. So I, again, we want to make sure that we're not, this is, this is for information purpose only, not intended to uh, as a sales pitch per se. So having said that, Jim, um, uh, I know you and I were chatting a little bit before, uh, and you're originally from Boston, right? Yeah, fellow, that's, uh, fellow Red Sox fan. You got it, Bruins, Patriots, and uh, <laughs> even, even so. There you go. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, uh, I'm a very unique person, obviously, to tell the Texas story because I was not born here. Mm -hmm. uh, when I look around our company, there's 20, 22 of us, uh, almost to a person. They were born elementary school, uh, middle school, high school, college, graduate school, and, and I remember uh, a handful of years ago, my wife's from Texas, and uh, you know saying I was going down to meet Jim McAllister, CEO and President of Rock Spring, and she looked on the website, and they were all, you know, University of Texas, University of Houston, Texas Tech, <laughs> and she goes, they're not even going to let you in the door, you know? And wow. I, I walked in, 45 minutes later, we shook hands, and we've been partners ever since. And, um, and so, you know, I, I'm unique, and uh, I, I used to work at the Berkshire Group uh, right out of college in Boston, and we were a multi-billion-dollar uh, private equity. Now, Berkshire. Group. Are you talking about uh, Mr. Buffett's? Uh... No, no. Uh, another Berkshire Group, uh, headquartered out of Boston, but you know they, they were worth billions as well. Not not as mm -hmm. many billions, but you know I, I got a real. My friends tell me a real PhD in real estate, uh, and we the family was super wealthy. We we bought through partnerships. We had a private REIT. We actually. Now, are you talking? This was in Boston. In Boston. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Back where I really got my education in real estate. Mm -hmm. We had a real estate investment trust that we ran. It was New York Stock Exchange, you know, publicly traded. Uh, we ended up taking that private in, in a couple billion dollar transaction with Goldman Sachs and the Blackstone mm -hmm. Group. I've uh, helped build a mortgage company, and, and we sold it to uh, Deutsche Bank uh, back in Boston as well. And so wow. I've, been around, I've been around family office money. I've been around institutional capital, and um, so, I, so I got a real understanding of lending, like you do as well, as well as real estate investing. And so uh, my wife, who I've met on my travels, I was running the transaction team, the buy and the sell. Uh, I, she was a Texan. I met her here in Houston, and I 
talked to her into moving to uh, Boston for a few years, and uh, before long, uh, she told me she was moving south again uh, because of the didn't like the winters, eh? No, you got it. And so <laughs> I, uh, I, I really looked, and uh, I, I looked at you know where in the country she didn't really uh, care to come back to Houston per se, um, but you know I looked you know as, as an investor and as a person where I wanted to move my career and raise my children, and you know I picked Texas and. Picked it for a lot of reasons. I mean, you know, Texas uh, is very unique, one of 50 states, but it's got a lot of natural advantages. It's got a warm climate. Mm -hmm. it's, got a real, it's got a real central location. Very uh, diversified uh, as well, both uh, in terms of uh, geography and uh, economics and, and you know, people, is it not? These, these cities, and we'll talk about them a little bit, are, are very unique. A lot of people think it's, uh, you know, cowboys on a big oil well, but it couldn't mm -hmm. be further from the truth. Um, and a big part of Texas is uh, natural resources, for sure, uh, and we'll talk about energy. But, you know, you have to embrace natural resources, you know, not run for them and, or make it very difficult uh, to extract them from the ground. And, you know, Texas is very business friendly. And we like to call it the Texas model, but, uh, you know, it may shock people, but the Texas model is what attracts businesses here and attracts people to live here. And it's very low regulation, very business friendly low cost of living, uh, you know, it's a political year. Most people don't believe that our, our state legislature is in session once every two years. And so they're average citizens. They come over to the Capitol in Austin. They get to work wow. for a handful of months, and then they go home. And uh, <laughs> that that's actually the beauty. And Part so, of the Wild West. Yeah. So we're, we're going to circle back to some of that, uh, Jim. Uh, first of all, I, I do want to make a point. I know you got it on the, on the screen there about the partic particular deal highlights. I want to point out to everyone listening that you know, yeah, we are talking about a specific fund, and this is actually structured as a uh, mutual fund trust that's uh, built into an Alberta trust and and, and a Texas trust. What, bottom line is RSP eligible. So a lot of what we're going to talk about is an investment opportunity that's RSP eligible for. Canadians, you do not have to be an accredited investor, and we are talking about a land play. We're talking about effectively buying shares, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jim. Uh, correct, uh, uh, purchasing shares in a, uh, uh, a mutual fund trust that uh, is, uh, no, effectively is going to be purchasing some real estate in Texas and, and developing it. Yeah, you know, in, in real simple terms, it's it's a Canadian partnership that acquires, you know, units in a Texas partnership that buys real estate uh, basically with all cash. And so the money moves down. And, and up in uh, up in Texas, it's wrapped sort of in a mutual fund trust structure, which makes it very uh, eligible for RSP dollars. And so folks can invest in cash. Canadian residents, this is built for, uh, can invest in cash or RSP dollars. And, you know, so that's the beauty of the mutual fund trust. And we've, we've actually improved it a little bit and offered little features uh, as we've learned and, and have investors have asked us, uh, Canadians can invest in Canadian currency or this third fund, you actually can invest in U.S. dollars as well. Wow, okay, well, you know, let's circle back to that because I yeah. don't want to lose that point uh, yeah. and I want to make sure everybody who's listening on the line understands where we're going with this, yeah. but uh, before we get into the weeds uh, on that, on that uh, structure, let's um, Take a step back and tell me a little bit about um, this whole Texas Triangle because you know I'm, I haven't been down there. I'm not familiar with the Texas Triangle myself. I've heard lots about it. Um, so talk to me about uh, two things. Number one, um, the Texas Triangle, and then let's also dig a little deeper into who uh, Rock Spring is. Sure. So uh, what, what we refer Texas is a big place. I mean, it, it uh, coming from Boston. To get from, uh, I was used to driving eight, nine hundred miles and being almost in Atlanta. I mean, you could be almost yeah. across the country. I, I know your provinces are bigger, especially out west, and so nine hundred miles may not seem like much. But if you come over the Louisiana border and go all the way over to El Paso, which is New Mexico, it's about eight hundred and forty miles. Wow. But what, what we really uh, concentrate on is what is coined the Texas Triangle cities, and. If you look at the Texas map there, if you combine Houston, Austin, San Antonio, and Dallas, Fort Worth, it forms almost a, a perfect triangle, and mm. it's important. It's important because that's where 80 to 85 percent of the population lives, and that's where about the same amount of the GDP or the economic engine is in those big cities. And 
Uh, although it's a big geographic area, uh, that is where we focus our investment dollars because we like liquidity, we like transactions. We don't want to be caught in a smaller uh, you know, market down in the valley or way out west which is really Midland and Odessa, which are, uh, you know, where the Permian Basin and uh, where all the extraction of the energy, they're certainly going through a tough time there. But mm -hmm. so we, like, we like the big cities. Um, and then Rock Spring in particular, we can talk about the next slide, is uh, it's really a company that started in 1973, as I talked about. And today... It's been around. This is not, uh, you're not uh, throwing mud against the walls and trying out new ideas here. No, no, it's a, it's a very proven strategy. But you know, what's interesting at, at almost you know every turn, there's a lesson learned, and the model is enhanced and proven a little bit further. And I'll I'll talk about some of those lessons. Uh, you know, the father started it in the '70s. The current president and CEO, uh, Jim McAlish, is about 52. He's he joined him in '93, and then in '90 in, in uh, 2003, instead of doing single asset partnerships like most you know real estate guys start out. He took it to a fund structure, which is really, uh, you know, combining cash from lots of investors. And, and typically, his investors were uh, Texas and Houston, locally based, and they had built such a track record that uh, they, they, uh, you know, started p pooling the capital together uh, and having cash. And I, and I, you know, analogize it to like buying a home. If you know the submarket, you know the street you want to be on, uh, and you show up and you buy all cash, you get a little bit better deal than the next guy. And so right. that, that is really the model that we, we operate under. We, uh, we have a U.S. platform of raising capital. We have a very steady uh, flow of investors that go from L.A. all the way to New York City. Hmm. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, as I said, we recognized Canadians coming to our market and, and created a vehicle that we'll talk about later that's, that's super tax-friendly and efficient and makes it very easy for Canadians to invest. And so uh, since 2003, which is really the history we talk about, um, because that's where the funds started, uh, we've bought about 15,000 acres of Texas land. So uh, for some uh, ultra high net worths, that's probably the size of their ranch. But uh, yeah. 15,000 acres of investment real estate is, uh, is pretty sizable. And, and it's been residential lots and commercial and retail and multifamily and other. Um, and in the U.S., we've raised almost 300 million, and again in, in Canada, we've raised 50 million now. And so our strategy: uh, we have partners in Canada from Halifax all the way over to uh, Victoria, and, and right, everywhere, right. everywhere between. It's now, I, the history is really important. Oh, sorry, you were going to say? Uh, yeah, no, history is uh, certainly critical, and, and learning lessons and. You know, the father at one point uh, used leveraged with land, and land doesn't generate income uh, typically. Uh, mm -hmm. really because of land, and so you go you go from something that's uh, super capital preservation, buying land all cash, to leveraging it, and it becomes extremely dangerous. And so, the son watched the father. He watched him do incredibly well, and he he watched some missteps, and he really uh, fine tuned his business model to what we have today. You know that we're going to talk about. And so in, in 2003, really through 2009, Canadians are really used to, you know, traditional land banking, you know, larger suburban pathway mm -hmm. of growth assets. And in 2010, uh, I joined and I really took my experience that uh, I learned at the Berkshire Group and other places and really as an outsider came in and, and saw a model that was very similar to the experience I went through before when when we changed from real estate guys into uh, building a mortgage company, our expertise was really understanding neighborhoods and trends and submarkets and where to invest. And so, uh, you know, along with our investment committee, we, we changed the model from land banking into more of uh, land investing. And okay, well, that's I want to dig a little deeper as to what that means. And I think you've, you've got a slide there, if I'm not mistaken, that kind of really helps us understand that. Yep. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, because it, it's important to understand the difference between land banking and land investment. I mean, I mean, some people know I might not understand what the land banking is, and the, again, correct me if I'm wrong. That's where you just go, you know, buy. I mean, there's a company up here in Canada that's uh, well known for going out there and buying um, chunks of land in Alberta, and then hoping the city just reaches it eventually, and then adds value to that property. Yep. And you know, and that, and that is a uh, very proven, uh, great strategy. Um, one of the big changes in the U.S. came along in 2008 and 9, and, and we had recognized it fully and, and pivoted our model to buying smaller sites. But 
you know, the, the banking regulation of Dodd-Frank came along and made it incredibly difficult for uh, most of these land loans that uh, assets that we were buying and selling were done at the community bank or the regional bank level. Hmm. And so Dodd-Frank came along and, 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 you know, for all intents and purposes, uh, really favored the larger mega banks um, and, and made it very difficult uh, for local banks to lend on non-cash flowing assets, which was incredible for us because we were cash buyers. And so we... So uh, the relevance of that, I don't know what the Dodd-Frank uh, uh, yep. rules is, but I'm guessing that's something that came in after the subprime crisis and changed the banking rules that made it, as you said, difficult for uh, smaller banks to lend on non-cash flowing assets. That's right. That's absolutely right. And so if I'm interpreting what you're saying correctly, that would mean that uh, the guys coming in with cash are going to be in a stronger position. Absolutely. You know, we, we were always very good at finding sort of off-market, you know, because we're, we're local, uh, seeing deals before others. But, you know, that, that banking regulation really helped our business uh, tremendously. And, and, but in combination with that, we decided that a 1,000-acre tracks was not the way to go anymore. Uh, we were going to buy smaller. We were going to buy more urban and what we call cash flowing or covered land plays. And we'll mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit. But a covered land play is really a, a, a property, a piece of land that has a building on it. And it's generating cash flow, uh, which is nice. But we know because of the way the submarket is changing, and I'll show some slides, that there's a higher and better use. And uh, when you're a local guy, you, you can kind of do the math and, and watch rooftops and watch different things happening that people flying in don't don't see as inherently. And we know in you know X number of years, you know, two to three, uh, it's gonna go from a very industrial site to a more residential or higher and better use or retail, which is much more valuable uh, and people pay more for that land. So we, uh, sure. we, we recognize trends before others. Right, now we say we, you're talking about uh, a structure here where Jim McAllister was the president. And is Jim McAllister, is that the father or the son? That's the son. Uh, the son is running uh, Rock Spring Capital. Right. So basically since uh, 2000, uh, 1973, his father, Jim's been under the tutelage of his dad, so to speak, and uh, being able to understand how to um, – um, sorry. <laughs> My phone's going off. There you go. Um, so Jim was under the tutelage of his dad, and as a result, uh, he's been able to – recognize and build a lot of network because I mean, one of the big things you mentioned is that that local knowledge if a Canadian said wow I think the Houston market's hot I'm gonna hop on a plane go down there and buy something tomorrow uh, they'd be at a significant distinct disadvantage compared to uh, working directly with someone like Jim McAllister right and well Rock Spring yeah no uh, you know absolutely we uh, we present all over and um, you know I, I, I I'm in New York and the guy before me, you know, talks about uh, being in New York City and you know spending a hundred million on every asset type: office, retail, um, hotels, multifamily in every city in America. Um, and, and I just shake my head. I, that's not someone I want to invest in. in. Um, yeah. And and you know w when I get up afterwards and I talk about kind of what we do, and it's not only us, but you should find others like us as well that are in a high growth market and do something very unique. Um, you know, uh, people just flock to that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, the Rock Spring executive team is, you know, you, you mentioned Jim's name quite a bit, but, you know, it's much more than one guy. And, and yeah. that's, that's really the key to the success. Uh, you know, Bo Ryan, our COO and CV, uh, senior vice president, he runs the day-to-day -day company. He's a great private equity guy. He's been with Jim about 10 years. Michael Ross is, is really key to the operation. He screens all the acquisitions and works with the acquisition team um, in, in figuring out what deals make sense. And when we buy things, he's, he and his team are responsible for executing on the entitlements and, and you know, adding the real value. Um, I travel the globe uh, telling the Texas story and, and raising capital. We'll be in China in two weeks in Beijing uh, showing this very presentation. Mm. So it's a story that resonates. And so the real key you know, other than having you know very talented people under underneath, is really the acquisition and in guys. You know, half our team is dedicated. Uh, there's about 22 of us. Uh, more than 10 of us are in the markets, and there's four acquisition folks right in Houston alone. And then wow. there's three or four more over in San Antonio and Austin, and we're looking to grow into Dallas-Fort Worth uh, this year. 
so when you know when, when I'm out and I meet an owner and uh, you know he shares with me a piece of property that may be on the market, I'll call one of my guys and they'll be like, Ah, Jim, I saw that a year ago. It, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's it's Johnny Jones and you know X Y Z and I got my thumb on it. You know, I got it covered. And no. that's that's what I want to hear. Now, I have to, I have to say that I mean, Texas strikes me as a, an old boys network. Huh? As your wife alluded to, you know, what's this Boston guy going to do coming into? Uh, he, he's not from the University of Texas, um, yeah. so I get I get the sense, and this is one of the things when I first heard about um, the, the Rock Spring story that really resonated with me is that it, it strikes me that uh, Rock Spring has some excellent feet on the street, if you will. Um, yeah. That uh, sales and acquisition team, they're in the neighborhoods, they're in the markets, and they're going to catch wind of things uh, before they go put on the MLS. Is that kind of the, the, the gist of it? Absolutely, and you know, and they're very good at staying away from you know what we call landmines, right? Um, mm -hmm. they, you know, you, you could be driving down the street with them, and there'd be a property on the right, a property on the left, and they would never touch the one on the right because of X, Y, Z, uh, draining issues, or this or that, or bad schools, and it's just pretty fascinating. And, and this uh, this map here, lots of people have maps that uh, overlay a lot of public information, but what this really is is a transactional database. And they go into uh, each of these cities, and they've been building this out uh, for more than 10 years now, uh, and they all have access to it, and they record transactions. What's unique about Texas uh, versus uh, many of the other states in the United States is when a, a real estate transaction takes place, when a deed is recorded, there's no purchase price recorded on the deed. Oh, really? So you have so it's no not just public information? No public information. And so... Interesting. Uh, when you buy a home, they, they put up a range of about a hundred grand or so, um, right. but, but you don't know. And so they put this database together, and this is a neighborhood out in uh, uh, Katy, uh, which is a suburb of Houston. And, oh, this and they is Houston have, uh, we're looking at here, okay. Yeah, this is Houston we're looking at, and this is the I-10 uh, corridor, and you know, I-10 goes from Florida all the way to L.A., but this is uh, Fort Bend County, one of the highest growth counties in America, and they have it all color-coded. They know that blue is in the hand of builders. You know, red is in the hand of, uh, uh, you know, government agencies or so. And then some of the yellow ones are in, in the hands of private individuals. And so they really they attack the private individuals. And, you know, sometimes if a lot of land has been held for a long time by families, you know, they may know that something across the street sold, but they won't necessarily know the price. Um, and, and our guys do uh, through their networks and their sharing of uh, information with others. Uh, they've, they've really built a, a pretty tremendous database that gives okay, them... So just just pause for a sec. Sorry, Jim. You just said something that's really interesting. So you could have a guy who's a, who owns something privately, independently here, yep. uh, in one of these yellow boxes, so to speak, yep. and uh, they wouldn't have public access to knowledge in terms of what their neighbor's selling their property for. Yep. They, yeah, so absolutely. they might sit there and, and, and just as an aside, and if I'm not mistaken, I think I heard this at one once before uh, talking with... Uh, um, a Rock Spring uh, webinar in the previous bit. There's a lot of generational, well, we've seen this globally. Um, a lot of the baby boomers are now sitting and getting to an age where they're passing it on to the next generation. The next generation may or may not want it. Yep. Are, are you seeing a lot of that activity happening? Yeah, we do. And, uh, you know, we, we see a lot of out of state sellers that don't quite mm. understand what's going on. Um, here's a deal in here we'll talk about a little bit. A group out of Denver, nine siblings inherited it from their parents. Wow. And they, they didn't care to own something in Houston. They wanted cash, right? So, uh, but that's huge. I mean, that to me is a really, really important point because it, it strikes opportunity. It, 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 it screams opportunity because we are in such a unique um, time of our lives here when you've got the baby boomer generation aging, their parents are passing on, and uh, may have moved out of state. There's a lot of – I, I just find that as an interesting subtopic. Yep, and you know, and I'm not, uh, I'm not telling you we get every single deal, right? Uh, we, we've got the markets covered that we like to invest in. We know the submarkets we want to be in, and you know, sometimes we get beat up. But uh, we raise about a hundred million a year. We like to put about twenty-five million in each of these cities, and mm -hmm. um, you know, our average deal is maybe five million or so. And so, you know, we buy the best five deals that we can find in Houston and in San Antonio, and and that's how we run the business. And so uh, lo local market knowledge is, is critical to uh, being successful. And 
know, we had uh, the next slide, we had kind of talked about it. You know, the land business may be, sounds simple, but there's a lot to it. Uh, obviously, it's in the details, and if you look at this chart, there, there's growth strategies within the land uh, investment, and then there's cash flow strategies. If you look at the growth boxes, certainly buying what we call raw land or unentitled land, and then moving it through the planning and entitlement stage, that, that's really defined as land banking. So you're mm -hmm. really holding it, you're adding value behind the scenes, and then you're kind of selling to the next person in line. And we certainly do that. Kind of like buying, buying a raw material and, and, and creating a product from it. Yep, absolutely. And then uh, that, that was really where the father stopped. Uh, and, and the son and the investment committee, we recognized that, uh, especially in the downturn, that a lot of people didn't have money to do the horizontal development, right? Mm. So we, start, we started using our cash. You know, banks, not only were they not lending on land, forget about getting money for putting, uh, you know, lots on the ground, right? Um, and, and so we, we actually moved into that business as well and, and did it just in, in baby steps. Uh, you know, we, we had the capacity and the skill set, but what we're really interested in doing is putting, you know, the first set of lots on the ground or, or adding the sore capacity and some different things to really pop value further. Um, and if you so what, what exactly is horizontal development? Can you explain well, that a little bit? Uh, there's a couple. Uh, horizontal development is, is really um, putting the streets in. Um, putting the sewer under the ground, putting the drainage in, okay, and mm -hmm. everything but the vertical building. Okay, kind of the utilities. Yep. Make, making it almost, uh, positioning it to be a turnkey to a developer to come in and start building houses or whatever they're building. Yep. And so, you know, the, the, uh, uh, a home builder will come in and uh, you know, plug in the electricity and connect the lines and then put his home up. And oh, that, let me ask you this. Why wouldn't a developer just buy the land and do this whole thing, you know, from you know, soup to nuts, so to speak. Yep, and so uh, you did see a lot of that. Uh, in the run-up uh, in the early 2000s, you saw uh, lots of home builders, right, starting to get into the land business and, um, you know, capture, try to capture more of the profit that we were capturing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, when you step back 10,000 feet and take a look at it, you're, you're really seeing the same old story of someone that's really good at one thing, building homes, right? Ah, yeah. Then, then trying to get in uh, a little bit more vertically and, and not really uh, knowing what they're doing. And the other issue is a lot of a lot of home builders. Uh, some of the bigger public ones are certainly uh, in, in the business of uh, you know developing their own lots and kind of controlling their own destiny. But what we are effectively doing is really off balance sheet financing it for these guys, right? Mm -hmm. We're coming in, you know, we're putting the money in, and we're getting it all ready for them to focus on their core business. Uh, and it's mainly the regional regional home builders and some of the smaller ones that you know may want to put up 300 homes, uh, you know, not tens of thousands. But um, so we we play one important role, uh, you know, in that process. Right. Uh, and to be clear, you are not building homes, and apartment buildings, or shopping malls. Nope. And so if you continue on, you can see the covered land plays that we talk about and. Again, these are uh, these are very interesting land investments where there's a higher and better use of the property that you're currently buying, and we can share that a little bit later. But again, we're not going to that last box. We're we're not going vertical. Typically, uh, you know, when you build or you construct, you're using you know high high uh, leverage, which uh, you know we absolutely don't use. And so, uh, to sum up this, uh, a couple big summaries. Um, if you move from from the left over to the right. You know, I'd like to say that we buy it by the acre, and then we're selling it by the per square foot. Mm. Uh, oftentimes, we're we're breaking up maybe a 50-acre track. And we're selling, you know, the the back 40 to maybe a residential guy, and and they'll they'll pay a big premium just to focus on their part of their business. If they had to buy all 50 acres from you that you bought, then they would really steeply discount, you know, the 10 acres on front that are commercial. Or retail, and so we'll, mm -hmm. we'll sell the forty on the back to the uh, apartment guy or you know single-family home builder, and then we'll break up and we'll we'll sell the corner to a bank, which they'll pay, they'll pay a big premium. We'll sell the uh, the other eight or seven eight acres to maybe a uh, office building or something. And so interesting, we, we break things up as well, which which adds lots of value. And and the really, uh, you know, I'm I'm a capital markets guy. If, if you look, you know, over to the land side. I bet you haven't heard a lot of people approach you about a Texas land strategy, right? And so it's a very inefficient space, and so there's not a lot of capital that plays where we play. 
And mm, we're, interesting. We are actually one of the only, uh, you know, fully dedicated 20 plus private equity groups that focus on this business day in and day out. There's private individuals that come in and out of the space and, you know, do very well and we compete against them. And there are, you know, larger real estate companies that may buy 10% of their portfolio in land, but day in and day out, uh, you know, in these Texas markets, we are the, uh, as most of them are aware, the only one 100% dedicated to uh, investing in land. And as we move, you know, through the stages of value add, when we go to sell, you know, something that's ready for vertical development, when we go to sell to a, an apartment person that's ready, you know, to start constructing that ne next day, there's 10 or 15 people in our office that want to buy that. And so Interesting. we move it from a very uh, non-competitive space to a very efficient capital space. Now, some would argue, and I'm, I'm going to be the devil's advocate right now, uh, some would argue that uh, one of the reasons people, uh, that's not a crowded uh, space is because there's the, the riskiest, highest risk is getting into that land and moving it from land to planning, you know, phase one, two, and three. Uh, you know, would you feel that that is a, a fair statement or do you feel like you guys have mitigated that risk? Yeah, I, I you know, we, uh, well, <laughs> I guess as an outsider, you may uh, you know think about that, but we're, we're buying stuff that has activity all around it. You know, we're, we're not we're not buying pathway of growth, hoping that a city uh, someday will expand that way. If you know, if another fifty thousand people move to that neighborhood or that part of town, um, you know, we're, we're buying stuff that there's activity all around it. It's uh, you know got great school systems. And it's just a matter of time um, for it to be it to be used up and um, you know we're able to do that because we live in these markets every day. Mm -hmm. Jim, uh, do you have some examples that you can show, share with us of, of, of some of the stuff you've done in the past? I, I mean I, I like what you're talking about and I love the way yeah. you, you kind of uh, approach it not just but and, and I think we also need to really emphasize I don't know if we touched on this but when we talk about Texas and you might get to this and if you are let, let me know but uh, for everyone listening right now, we need to understand the, the Texas market, you and I were talking about this before, is, is the GDP is equal to that of all of Canada, is it not? Yeah, yeah it's pretty staggering. Uh, we'll, we'll cruise through a couple slides here. but um, So we are in our third fund, uh, you know, been very well received by Canadians. We certainly appreciate uh, our partnership uh, with each of our partners, Tribe you included. But I, I just wanted to show what a typical portfolio looks like that we buy. And mm. you can see uh, in our first $25 million fund, you know, it was geographic diversification. And then again, we're not buying large acreage. So these things can turn uh, very quickly. We, we've had uh, exits already. And um, there, there's nothing like an exit to uh, prove to someone that uh, your model works, right? Uh, just to clarify, when would Rock Spring 1 have, when would that have started? Uh, Rock Spring 1 would have started about two years ago. Two years ago, so that got close. You're raising a certain amount of money, then you close that off. You start yeah, Rock you Spring know. two. You raise a certain amount, close it off. Now we're on to Rock Spring three, which yep. is the potential opportunity we're talking about tonight. So I uh, just for, for for those listening, we're talking about Rock Spring one and two in the past tense. As again, I want to emphasize that uh, you know this is for informational purposes only, and uh, you know past performance is no indication of future performance. Okay, yep. but. Uh, having said that, it, it, it uh, is well worth looking at what you've done in the past uh, in terms of uh, what the track record is. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and again, Rock Spring 2 is uh, oversubscribed, and uh, a closed-end fund is, is what you're referring to, Peter. We, we raise capital. We spend it. When it hits $25 million, it's closed. The dollars are invested. When assets are sold, uh, the money gets returned. Uh, mm. So again, you know, we continued on our success and have bought, you know, very diversified by cities and in smaller uh, acreage as well. Um, you know, one of one of the questions before we get to Texas is lots of people ask us about, you know, FX or foreign exchange, and yeah, you know, uh, we studied it incredibly hard, and you know, my my take and the investment committee and our corporate governance, our directors, um, we're here to really educate people and, and to remind people that you know today we're we're sitting at a buck twenty five, a buck thirty or so, and that's really the that's U.S. Uh, U.S. Yeah, and that's really the twenty five year average of where our uh, dollars are traded versus mm -hmm. each other. Uh, so lots of people have uh, you know a little quick memory over the last handful of years that your dollar was in a very favorable uh, uh, position against the U.S. dollar, uh, but we've returned 
to sort of the uh, the mean or the median, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so kind of uh, gotten by. And by the way, for those listening, uh, translation here, of course, is a seventy-five cent uh, loony, but uh, it's actually in the Canadian government would actually support uh, uh, our our dollar where it's at. It helps with our exporting and manufacturing. Um, having a Canadian dollar at par is not necessary. It's, it's great for everyone uh, crossing the line from Vancouver down to Bellingham and going shopping on the weekend or taking your trip down to Vegas. But uh, from a government perspective, from an economic perspective, it's not uh, where, it, where it is right now is probably where they want to keep it. Yep, certainly helps your manufacturing base for sure. Um, and then the yeah, so just touched on that. So well, before, I know you and I talked about. Can you talk about the concept of dollar cost averaging when it comes to the Canadian dollar? Because some people are going to sit there, well, that's all great, but what if the dollar goes back up to 85 cents? And you know, yep. we'll just touch on that briefly because the the concept of dollar cost averaging is important here when it comes to exchange. Sure. While we have the ability in our offering memorandum uh, to do uh, some sophisticated balance sheet hedging, um, we've actually backed away and said, you know what, a, a simpler, easier way is what we call dollar cost averaging. And it, 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 it's simple in the sense that as we raise dollars, we have closings every two weeks. Our CFO uh, converts Canadian dollars to U.S. dollars, and they sit up in, uh, in a Canadian bank. And when we have an investment, then it moves cross-border. And what that does is it just avoids moving you know, $5 million at uh, a bad moment, uh, per se, right, when the dollar is you know, fluctuating one way or another. Um, and so we dollar cost average in over, over the next year. We'll raise you know the X number of million, and it'll come out to a weighted average, a weighted average over a period of time. Mm. And then the same concept is you know we're not selling all this real estate. We'll start selling after year one, and it'll conclude. Uh, the business plan is by year five, and they'll in a fifty million dollar portfolio. The average investment's five million, so we'll have ten investments, and within those ten investments, there'll be partial exits. Uh, breaking up assets and, and selling and to be them. clear, to be, to be clear, when you say the uh, average investment is means Rock Springs investment, not the average investors' yeah. investment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The average property investment, right? Yeah. And so we'll dollar cost average on the way out as well. We'll return, you know, U.S. dollars. We'll convert them back uh, to those investors that uh, ask for Canadian back, and we will, uh, over a period of time, you know, there may be 20, 25, possibly 30 checks that come back. So right. again, you're not, you're not waiting on a certain day. And, and just to be clear, uh, for those listening on the line, looking and even thinking about maybe investing in this, you should be looking at about a five-year window, right? You're 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 putting your capital in, you're making an investment into this project, uh, this this fund that is going to start accumulating, and it's considered what's uh, what we call a blind pool at first because the assets haven't been purchased yet. Um, and as you accumulate and raise $50 million, you start accumulating and buying assets, the average of which will be $5 million. And once you get to $50 million, you close off that fund. Yep. You will be purchasing it along over a time frame, thus dollar cost averaging the, 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 uh, the loony compared to the greenback. And then on the, upon, upon the exit, the exit is, is staked over a period of time. And all of this occurs over a five-year period. So someone investing X dollars today should be looking at fully being vetted and capitalized and having a return uh, on that investment in year five, by year five. Is that correct? Yep, yep. that is, okay. that is uh, well said. Uh, private equity is certainly uh, longer term than putting money in your uh, bank account down the street, right? But, you know, for that ability of tying it up, uh, three to five years is the target. Uh, you get a premium for that, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And that's what investors like. And also, by the way, one of the reasons uh, and uh, to be very clear for everyone listening, that's why you don't put too much of your investable assets into one project. Uh, this should be a percentage allocated towards something of this nature. might be a good, uh, and Jim, you and I were talking about this. This is actually, yeah. actually be a good way of hedging your Canadian assets with some U.S. dollar, uh, or U.S. investments. Yep, that, you know, that's exactly right. Um, that was another reason we kind of backed off from doing some uh, you know, sophisticated 30-day swap you know, hedging foreign exchange structures is a lot of our, our larger advisors, tribe you included, said, you know what, our, our portfolio guys, our advisors are using you as a natural hedge against their Canadian investments. And, you know, if, if the Canadian uh, economy falters a little bit, then the U.S. real estate will be worth even more. And the inverse, the inverse is if your Canadian holdings uh, 
you know, and your economy improves at a faster rate than the U.S., then then you're in good shape because all your other buckets in Canada are are, are doing well. So you know, as an advisor like you, Peter, you uh, you know, it would be a natural hedge just allocating to the U.S. or maybe even to another country, right? Right. Yeah, I just say, you say, okay, here's my overall ass, uh, investable assets. I've got some in Canadian real estate, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. Where do I have exposed to U.S. Uh, markets? Uh, so you can take a percentage of that. And, uh, and, and again, it's RSP eligible. So let's go in. Uh, Todd, tell me a little bit about uh, the next slide here. Yeah, let's, let's uh, you know, I, I know, uh, you know, you know, Canada's economy is a little bit more dependent on oil. And certainly Houston, uh, everybody thinks, is a big oil town. And so uh, this slide was put together uh, with the help of our economists, and and we'll talk about some recent stats uh, that will amaze a lot of people. Uh, but we'll remind people: uh, I didn't live here in the '80s, but uh, this this is not you know my dad's Houston. You know this this mm -hmm. Houston has diversified greatly. If you well, by the way, that's an important conversation for Albertans because up here in Canada, many people are going to say, whoa, 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 Texas is oil, Alberta's yep. oil, look, Alberta's getting the tar kicked out of them, no pun intended. Um, and so, hey, you know, uh, aren't we going to have the exact same problem if we invest in, in Texas? Yep. And, and so, you know, it's just real big picture, right? You know, we could we could spend a whole, whole hour talking about uh, oil and its impact on Houston and, and elsewhere. But... You know, when you look at the energy sector, there, there's certainly the upstream, the midstream, and then the downstream where all the refineries are. And people need to be reminded uh, that the majority of the refineries are here in Houston, uh, right on the Gulf. And so those, that part of the engine, the energy engine, is, is working overtime right now, and they're putting billions of dollars in the infrastructure mm. uh, because oil's still flowing here, right? And, and uh, certainly the, the energy, the extraction part or the upstream part of it uh, out in Odessa and Midland, it's struggling, and you know Denver and the Dakotas and and elsewhere, and, and I suspect Alberta to a great part. If you're really relying on pulling the resources out of the ground, it it's getting better every day. But it, you know it, it had been tough the last uh, 12 months or so. But Houston in particular, uh, in the 80s, uh, when oil went to ten dollars, it got hurt really bad, and it got hurt because it was losing jobs. Number one, you can see it lost in that two-year window. 133,000 jobs on a job base that was uh, much lower, but the developers were going crazy. And you could look at 50 million square feet of office coming online and you know go down the ranks, and then 61,000 single-family homes. Today, we'll, we'll talk about the recent stats. We're adding jobs. You know, we added. Well, I, we also have to remind ourselves. Uh, I don't know about the states, but in Canada, we had 22% interest rates in 1982. Yeah. Yep. And so, uh, you know, back then we were adding 60,000 single-family homes. Today we're adding 25,000. So the real estate markets are much more in balance than they were. Now, now that, you know, I wouldn't want to be delivering an office building in the energy quarter in Texas, in, in Houston here, uh, based on, you know, increased rent projections. That's probably not going to end well. But when you look at our business, uh, you know, delivering land to single-family home builders and other select commercial assets, there's a real imbalance, and we'll show you some charts on that as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's just talk about Texas in, in general. Uh, it's a big place. The cities are big. Five of the top 16 cities in population. Uh, Houston, number four. Uh, wow. within, five, within five or six years, it'll move ahead, move ahead of Chicago as the wow. third largest city in America. Mm -hmm. And the population projected to double between 2000 and 2040. Uh, today, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. And uh, between now and 2040, the equivalent of the state of Florida's population, another 20 million people are going to be moving here to Texas. Well, keep in mind, we only have 33 million in all of Canada. <laughs> yeah. And so, again, they're all going to end up, you know, a majority of them are going to end up in the Texas Triangle. And mm. so, uh, and what's, what's interesting is we went back and tracked the 1850s was the first census, census, census. Every 10 years they do it. And. You know, Texas has outpaced the average by 2.2 times for those business-friendly, climate, central location reasons. Uh, okay, I was just going to ask you, what's the big attraction here? Yeah, the, you know, maybe not July or August, but uh, <laughs> it, the generally warmer climate uh, mm. is, a, is a big one. Um, GDP, you know, I, was, I was amazed when we updated this, this in December. You know, Texas moved up a couple notches. It used to be the 13th largest in the world if it was its own uh, economy. It's number 11 now. You know, it moved that's ahead of That's incredible. 
you know, just this one state has moved ahead of Canada. And and what's really fascinating is how crippled Russia got, right? It's yeah. fallen way, way down off the chart. Okay, so this is really important, Jim. Just, just want to pause here because go back to the last slide. You know, again, I can't emphasize this enough for everybody listening because when you think about uh, Alberta and the impact that oil's had on the Alberta economy, it's been significant. I mean, it's really crippled the Alberta economy and hurt them. And yet, uh, here's an oil, uh, the perception. Perception is Texas is an oil-based economy, therefore it should have just uh, been crippled with the uh, dropping of the price of oil just in the same way Alberta is. But I think it's critical to look at the GDP is larger than Canada and maybe talk a little bit about the fact that uh, why, uh, as oil drops, uh, Texas doesn't follow suit. Yeah, I mean these uh, these these cities that we talked about are really independent. Uh, they're pretty incredible. They're like uh, four or five East Coast cities, you know, like Boston, like where I came from. But you know, Houston is uh, it's got an engine of energy for sure, but it's got a port. Um, you know, Warren Buffett a handful of years ago bought all the rail lines coming out of the port. Hmm. He uh, he knew that the Panama Canal was being widened, right? And the yeah. super tank, the super tankers that used to stop in Oakland or the West Coast, uh, now can come through the Panama Canal here shortly. And the infrastructure that they're building out in in Houston, it's going to become, they say very quickly, the second largest port in the United States. Interesting. And, and it's got the largest medical center in the world. Uh, hmm. It's got a very culturally diverse, uh, you know, a city. Uh, Dallas is more of a distribution hub. Um, you know, its largest employer is American Airlines. When when oil and gas get cheaper, that economy actually does incredible. But, uh, <laughs> That's uh, very important to understand that. Yeah. Yeah, and so our you know our economists uh, showed us data that said that the economy of, of Dallas was negatively correlated with oil. Cheaper hmm. got, the better it did. You move wow. over to Austin, and and Austin is you know Michael Dell's town. He created the whole technology corridor. Most Californians that get fed up with paying taxes or you know, being over-regulated end up in Austin. Mm. And it's got a high-tech boom there. It's got the capital. It's got the university. Uh, it's got the lakes. It's a very cool, hip place to live. And San Antonio, is, uh, it's got a lot of retirees, a, a lot of uh, uh, other activities as well. But these, these, these cities are very diverse and, and not correlated with each other. And more importantly, not correlated with oil. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, sometimes I, I, I tell folks that facts are stubborn things. When you look at December, jobs created in 2015, of the, of the 10 most populous states uh, in America, Texas was number three. You know, California, Florida, you know, and Texas for the last 10 years, 15, 20 years, had really blown away every other state. So oil had a slowdown on it for sure. But, you know, we still added 170,000 jobs because of all the other diversification that we have. Hmm. And unemployment, another way to look at it in December, uh, of those same 10 most populous states, Ohio and Texas, and I, and I hate to bring politics in, but run by conservative governors, right? Yeah. Uh, Kasich is running Ohio. I mean, uh, they're letting businesses and, and, and people do their thing and really getting out of their way. And you can see what's happening to uh, unemployment. It's lower than the average. Interesting. When you look at, uh, yeah, look at, when you look at that. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, California had the largest job growth, but the highest unemployment. Yep. So they uh, they're coming out of a huge hole, right? Yeah. That, that that's the message. But you know, Illinois and California, big liberal, you know, uh, very democratic run states, big union states. Um, you know, they get high unemployment. Hmm. Um, and then here's a little chart. Uh, it just really shows uh, statistically that upstream energy jobs you know, that have been added in the last five years in Texas, uh, only 7% were directly related to upstream or extracting um, jobs. So upstream means? Up upstream means, you know, pulling the resources out of the ground. Okay. You know, the drilling and the mining. Um, and then when you look at Houston, which is certainly more energy dependent than the other cities, only 12% of the jobs were directly related. Wow. So that's, that's A lot of yeah. people don't understand that for sure. Well, that certainly uh, bursts a lot of myths um, and uh, or busts a lot of myths that uh, people would think that's just 100% uh, dependent on oil. Yeah, we'll, we'll hit a couple more Texas slides and then we'll move on. But here's the boom and the bust in the U.S., uh, the housing market. This is if you bought a $200,000 home in each of the Sunbelt markets. And I know uh, lots of Canadians love to invest in Phoenix and 
uh, Arizona's there, California, Florida. Mm -hmm. But you saw what happened. Big boom, big bust. The Texas yeah. cranked, cranked along during that time at 2.6% annual. And, and a big part of that was uh, our banks didn't allow people to do more than 80% uh, home equity uh, lines. Texas banks. Texas banks. Yep. Interesting. And that, that really prohibited uh, investors from moving in. And here's a chart that really talks about our core business, but uh, the blue and the green are population, so we're in a growing market again. And the red and the black lines are uh, lots being finished and then absorbed, the red by home builders. They're correlated, they move together. And you can see in 06, with the mortgage meltdown in the US and, and the subprime, everything fell off the cliff because land developers and home builders couldn't get loans. But you know, we bought them in 010 and 011 and we're moving back up. But you know, we'll get back to you know, the 50-year average, which is up near the population uh, numbers where they are. So a, a huge upside potential there. Yep, I like to call it a uh, tailwind at our back, right? Mm, yeah. Here, uh, here's another, hopefully our last chart on Texas, but uh, this, this chart, simply amazing. If you look at the top 10 housing markets in the United States, uh, the Texas Triangle cities that we talk about represent 55% of the annual starts on, on homes. And wow. Houston, Houston, number one. Uh, I, ju I just saw a press release yesterday that Dallas uh, has surpassed Houston, you know, but they're neck and neck. And absolutely, Houston has slowed year over year, uh, as it should. But you, know, you got to remember, uh, still, the number one or number two housing market in the U.S. Okay, so Jim, um, we got about we're kind of uh, at that point. We're looking to wrap up here in the next five minutes or so. So maybe give us an example of some of the things that you guys have done in the past, and then uh, what is the opportunity that uh, everyone who's on the call listening might uh, benefit from if they were uh, interested in this? Sure. So you know, the, the message is Texas is growing. The message is that you know Rock Spring is certainly local and understands better than anyone you know where to invest in these cities. Here is a perfect example. Uh, 610 is the first beltway around Houston. You're looking at a Houston neighborhood here. Uh, this is what we call a covered land play. It has an equipment supply company on there. But when you look across the way, you can see them already tearing down, uh, you know, buildings and aggregating buildings. And, you know, we thought uh, this would be a two to three year hold. And it was actually a family out of Denver. And uh, they hadn't been to Houston when oil was falling. They said, heck, we're out of here. We'll take your mm. cash. Our guys bought it, turned it around in seven months. It was our first sale for our Canadian folks and uh, earned a substantial return on the real estate side, about 60%. When you add the currency factor in, uh, you know, Canadians made 109% wow. IRR on their money in seven months. Um, this deal actually led to the Houston Business Journal uh, Real Estate Deal of the Year. Hmm. And then it also led, uh, a couple weeks ago, our first real estate trust one, your, mar your private capital markets up in Canada. I remember, yeah. We, uh, Triview Capital was, uh, had a lot of our clients were in that deal, and uh, we won an award up here in Canada for the best uh, real estate deal of the year. Yeah, here's another real quick neighborhood. I, I just want to show you what a, what a changing neighborhood is. Again, it's infill. This is, this is stuff we buy. There, there's no really vacant land around here. Very active. Mm -hmm. What's amazing is two streets south of this property, uh, you can see the change. I, I was here yesterday with an investor. Uh, on one side of the street is a 1950s, 1,100-square-foot home. Uh, and four houses down on the other side, home builder bought something similar, scraped it, built a 3,900-square-foot home this year. It's under contract for $975,000. Bottom line, area in transition. So you guys are really good at identifying areas in transitions and opportunities therein. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I like to say a little bit before others, right? Yeah which is uh, the real value. And so, um, you know, I, I certainly appreciate uh, everyone's time. We, we talked a lot about Texas and um, just to share what, what folks through Peter and Tribeview and other exempt market dealers only, uh, what they offer you is access to us. And uh, in particular, you know, the offering at the moment is, is a mutual fund trust. Um, we are just rolling it out. It will be $50 million and our auditors are PricewaterhouseCoopers. Our legal is Gowling. We have independent directors up in Alberta, two of them that uh, keep a close oversight on the company. Um, we have made it incredibly uh, tax efficient for Canadians to invest. Um, 
in the most. And that's because of the, because of the structure that the fact that you've taken a real estate trust, uh, sorry, a mutual fund trust, and put it through an Alberta partnership. That's what uh, allows us to offer it here in Canada as an RSP eligible product. Yep, and, and the extra bonus, which is uh, almost as important, is uh, your investors are not required to file a U.S. tax return. Mm -hmm. so the, Alberta, the Alberta Partnership is doing that and then providing what we call a blocker to the investors behind it, uh, which is super attractive to Canadians and why I say we've made it so easy. Wow, and and now I know we 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 yeah you know, we can't really say uh, tar we can talk about targeted returns. You're targeting about a ten percent uh, return on an annual basis here, but the idea is that this is something if you invest today, it's going to sit there for a three to five year hold, correct? Yeah, uh, three to five year hold. Uh, uh, the plan, like our uh, Rock Spring one and two, they they got checks uh, right at one year or month eleven or twelve. Uh, no, that check. When you say check, that doesn't mean they got all their money back. Just no. if, if uh, uh, like that uh, one play, um, well, partial, uh, sorry, uh, covered land play that you were talking about, where we, you know maybe someone say, oh, you got lucky on that one. That was seven or eight, nine months, and then all of a sudden there was a sale transaction. So some of the investors would have got some of their money back. Is that correct? That's correct. We we call it a you know a partial distribution, right? That that mm -hmm. one sale returned twenty three percent of the capital that was invested. And um, you know, I, listen, they all don't work that that well, right? That quick. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, in my life, I found that um, you know the hottest working people I've ever met seem to be the most luckiest, right? <laughs> Isn't that the fact? You know, I, one last thing I want to touch on here, Jim, uh, because it's important. Uh, this is considered a blind pool. Can you explain exactly what that means? Yeah. So um, you know, before we started the fund structure. Um, you know, the, the company used to do limited partnerships, used to identify an asset, used to call its investor base and say, would you like to invest in Maine and Maine and here's four acres? And that, that was uh, great, but it would take time. And mm -hmm. so what, what we believed to get better values was to buy that Maine and Maine, but to know, uh, know that market cold, but to buy it in two weeks, you know, to, to get your environmental due diligence and make sure there's no fatal flaws but to move with lightning uh, quickness. And so in order to do that, um, you know, investors need to read the offering memorandum and understand that the management team has the ability to invest in, in these types of assets. And, and what we've done is we've really restricted. Uh, our company has the ability to buy these land and covered land plays um, only in Texas and only in these big cities. Uh, and so we, you know, we can't run off and do something in California or the islands or Anything That's, like that. Uh, as described, it, it, you're limited by what's in that offer memorandum. That's right. We have fully restricted us to what our skill set is, Texas land. And uh, although, you know, a blind pool is, you know, people are trusting us to invest in, in what we say we will do in the offering memorandum, the offering memorandum is so strict as to what we can do. And you can look back on the last 50 or 100 properties we bought, they, they pretty much look, look very similar. Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, regards of what you invest in, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of people have good stories out there. My personal experience is uh, stories. One thing is the people behind it who are the more most important component of it. And uh, I have to say, I've heard nothing but great things about the job that you and your team are doing down there. Uh, and if you are, I can't emphasize enough for anybody. Uh, I've heard a lot of people talking about going down in the states and picking up deals, and I can't emphasize enough that. Um, this is not something you want to just kind of go and try it on your own type thing. Uh, it's critical to have a you know people on the ground that you can trust, who have a track record, uh, and uh, that some due diligence has been done, and you're not throwing mud mud against the wall, so to speak. So, Jim, I I have to say I I, I love what you guys are doing here. Uh, I'm looking forward to working with you more. Uh, and I just want to say thank you for taking the time tonight. I know it's getting late for you down there in Houston, so thanks for sharing with us tonight. No, I uh, I, I, I enjoy you know again you know this was uh, this was a lot about Texas, and uh, I love telling the story. I, I think it's it's so unique. I travel around and and you know different countries, and and I just don't see the opportunity that I see here, and and you know even some of the cities in uh, Canada as well. You know, I, you got to remind yourself that uh, you, you know you were really won the lottery when you were born in North America or where you live. Yeah. You know, 
And so I, I wish everyone uh, great success. And if you want to learn more, please uh, call Peter. Uh, it'd be a great resource for our company, and he's got other great products as well. Hey, I appreciate it. And uh, a final reminder to everyone, this is uh, for information purposes only. And if you're interested in an investment with Rocks from Capital or any other products, please contact me directly. And last but not least, I can't emphasize enough that uh, regardless of whatever you invest in, it's critical that you do a gap analysis, understand, a gap analysis and understand where you are, where you're going, what your plan is to get there, and do a proper allocation of your assets in the proper uh, amounts. In other words, uh, don't over allocate any percentage of your assets into one particular asset class, etc. So uh, again, I want to thank everyone. Jim, thank you very much. It was awesome. And if you want any more information, please don't hesitate to call me, Peter, or email me rather, Peter at PeterKinch.com. Of course, if you're on this webinar, you've got my ad email address already. Folks, thanks a lot. It's been a great night, and I appreciate you being on the line tonight. Uh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Jim. Bye-bye.